Good morning. Well, actually, before I introduce this morning's panel, I'm, you'll indulge me for 20 years. I'm going to take a few minutes and talk with you um, a little bit about our history and where we're going. But first, a moment like this cannot happen without acknowledgments. 20 years is a long time. And I would like to thank Peter Miller, Dean Simon, Mark LeBlanc, who helped organize this symposium, mark numerous emails and coordinating details. I would like to thank the faculty of the Bard Graduate Center, who have increasingly become close colleagues. I appreciate your support and willingness to participate in our shared projects. I would like to thank the facilities and security staff, development and finance staff, and of course, especially the staff of the gallery with whom I have the privilege of working every day. We are indeed a team, and I think that without that mentality, we would not be where we are today. So just for a few moments, you'll indulge me. I confess that I approach this moment with trepidation. I might say more precisely, considerable trepidation, my mind unstoppable in its thinking about the meaning of looking back. And I am eminently qualified to do so, being one of two staff still employed by the BGC whose tenure began before we even opened. Why does a numerical anniversary warrant retrospective consideration of how we started, where we have been, what we have achieved? How can I work against a linear account or construct a legitimate and thoughtful account of a history that seemed at once so close and too far away to fully grasp. Cautious about the dangers of dwelling on the past, not doing it, as Susan said, has contributed substantially to our success, I admit having felt stymied. But a search for a meaningful method of inquiry, a meaningful method of inquiry, relieved me of this constraint. I found a way into this return to the past using the writing of Edward Said. Although I trust most well known to many of you for his groundbreaking work, Orientalism, Said actually wrote extensively on the notion of beginnings returning to it many times in his work, starting in 1967, in numerous subsequent essays until 1975, when he published a book entitled Beginnings that was reprinted in 1985. Said's Beginnings raised questions that I believe are fitting to this occasion. He asked simply, what is beginning? What must one do in order to begin? What is special about beginning an activity, a moment, or a place? Can one begin whenever one pleases? What kind of attitude or frame of mind important is necessary for beginnings? And finally, the questions that I found most compelling, he asked if historically there is one sort of moment that is most propitious for beginning, one sort of individual with whom beginning is the most important of all activities. Ultimately, Said investigated what sort of thought takes place as one begins or as one thinks about beginning, the mark of intentionality. Grounded in this constellation of questions, I return to our beginning, actually finding relatively little deviation in our practice from the very first exhibition, our inaugural exhibition in 1993. I discovered that that beginning had been rather remarkable, perhaps even groundbreaking in its curatorial thinking. Ultimately, if I was to characterize the motivations for this beginning with a singular thought, I would say without reservation that knowledge and using Said, a moment a frame of mind fixated on the idea that the acquisition, production, and dissemination of knowledge that emerges from studies of the decorative arts was a valid discipline, a form of scholarship, and a basis for curatorial thinking. 
In January 1992, approximately 20 months prior to the opening of the gallery, I began working at the Bard Graduate Center. When I arrived at our temporary space on Madison Avenue, an office building between 67th and 68th Streets, I joined a staff of four, among them our founder, as she said, a graduate of the inaugural year of the Cooper Hewitt Master's Program, who was then literally becoming an institution builder. There was also a newly appointed dean, a man, it's fair to say, with an incomparable knowledge of the field, whose mastery of the history of the decorative arts was only matched by his exceptional eye. He was a connoisseur, in French, an amateur. Then, without a graduate degree, and at times overtly disdainful of the formalities and authority he often said characterized academic life. Myself, Susan said, also a graduate of the inaugural year of the Cooper Hewitt. Since graduation, I had completed my coursework for a PhD in art history at the CUNY Graduate Center while working at the American Craft Museum. Thus, there was between us, in a Deleuzean sense, a friendship, a sense that we were embarking on this shared enterprise, bringing the decorative arts from the margins to the center of public awareness. Coupled with the terminological and canonical challenges, there was a roster of substantive and practical matters that required attention. Accreditation from the state, finding faculty, recruitment of inaugural class of students, building a library, bringing a building at number 18 West 86th Street that at that time was a chantier gutted to completion. On the gallery side, we had no collection, no loans, no reputation, no gallery furniture, no equipment of any kind, and no program. <laughs> but there was an idea and a vision that this newly forming graduate program devoted to the history of decorative arts and a part of the college would have a gallery. Joining the gallery at this historical moment was remarkably opportune because the college itself was at an unprecedented moment in its own expansion. With all of these factors coinciding, a decision was made to inaugurate the gallery with a traveling exhibition from the American Federation of Arts on gold boxes from the Gilbert Collection, a decision that was actually made prior to my arrival. Two months after and 16 months to the day of our opening, the AFA abruptly canceled that project. Creating a future program was something we expected to work on as we advanced, but suddenly being with no inaugural show was another matter. <laughs> Yet it was from this challenge that we emerged, from this propitious moment. We invested thoughts in our practice at a level of depth that certainly would not have come then if the situation had progressed as originally planned. That cancellation was our beginning. The immediate line of thinking was that with Winter Tour well established, our project would have an international focus. At that turbulent moment, we did not move to define the gallery as a teaching space in direct association with the emerging BGC academic program. This seemed to be far too many risks associated with that endeavor and clearly too many on the gallery side. As a Kunsthalle dependent on loans, we would instead focus on our public identity appropriating Susan called it sometimes Parasite, an exhibition that had already been realized, but transforming it for a New York audience. That project was along the Royal Road, Berlin and Potsdam and KPM porcelain and painting, 1815 to 1848. In its first iteration, it had been an exhibition at Charlottenburg Palace in Berlin, examining the Veduta paintings of Carl Daniel Freydank, a painter active between 1838 and 1848. Our thought shifted from realization of something preconceived by the AFA to transforming a project that would eventually investigate the multifaceted transformation of Prussian culture at that decisive historical moment in the beginning of the 19th century. To achieve this, we assembled a team of scholars from the museum and academic areas. Princeton professor, professor of German history, Theodor Zolkowski, art historian in Berlin, Jürgen Julia, curators at Charlottenburg Palace, and world-renowned porcelain experts, Ilsa and Winfried Baer, who worked with us as part of a curatorial team, helping to shape the ideas, identify the themes, negotiate the loans from other German institutions and from individuals. Within weeks after the AFA canceled, and I have reflected on this lately, canceled the exhibition, we were in Berlin 
Imagine what it was like at the end of 1992. The wall had come down in November of 89, and the place where Checkpoint Charlie had been and where today there were enormous buildings was an open, grassy field. To further elucidate the meaning of these decorative paintings, we engaged a photographer, Bruce White, who reshot the Freydank views, offering a vantage point that was contemporary. There they are at the bottom right and illuminating of the trajectory of transformations from the first quarter of the 19th century to the time of the Third Reich to the moment of euphoria and change that came following another beginning in 1989. Using objects to tell stories, to write history, to understand cultural transformations, to know the materiality of porcelain, that was our goal. The questions we asked, the meanings we sought, came from these things, their place embedded in the historical themes that emerged from a study of Berlin and Potsdam that we then published in our first catalog, you saw it before, <laughs> a self-publishing endeavor with an international group of contributors. With the book and exhibition in formation, we then embarked on the line of inquiry about display practice, focusing on the basic necessities of devising a system of display furniture to the most creative dimension of all, applying curatorial thinking to shaping the design. Thus the project, our first in the gallery, initiated our curatorial thinking and the interdisciplinary methods of interpretation that would come to characterize our publications. Resisting recounting a chronological list of past projects, I will offer just a few thoughts on the exhibitions that we might call game changers, each one in itself another beginning. Cast Iron from Central Europe, an exhibition that moved our research to Vienna and to Birmingham, Alabama, to the Technical Museum in Vienna where we examined the history of cast iron, an under-recognized base metal studying its use as jewelry in the creation of metals, furniture, and sculpture, and we devised these wall-hung medallions from which hung magnifying glasses so you would actually be able to carefully look at intricate details of the cast iron process that we further evoked through the model of a foundry. You see it up there at the top. Then, moving through time quickly, AWN Pugin, an exhibition that opened in November 1995 that continued the line of curatorial thinking that had begun with Along the Royal Road, reappropriating or what we were then calling bardizing, an existing project, but this time the institution was the Victoria and Albert Museum. The furniture in particular that was shown in this exhibition, designed for the Houses of Parliament, the Great Exhibition of 1851, including the Gothic Revival Cabinet, it's up there on the right, that had been in three other venues before coming to us. The 1851 exhibition, Pugin's Own Home, and the V&A made this exceptional. A.W.N. Pugin, Master of Gothic Revival, established our long-term collaboration with Yale University Press that flourished under the auspices of John Nichol, a towering figure in the art publishing world. Mentor and partner, Susan and I learned about the publishing world from this remarkable individual. And when he left Yale, Sally Salveson, she's in this room today, took over our list, helping to shape our projects, periodically serving as book designer, and bringing our publications to realization at the printer. A landmark in research and scholarship and a project grounded in feminist studies, women designers, curated by Pat Kirkham, marked the turn of the new millennium and through laborious research, unearthed the numerous under-recognized women who had contributed to 20th century design history. Then there were a group of projects that addressed the emergence of applied arts industries and companies, among them the brilliance of Swedish glass that initiated our collaborations in the Nordic countries and most recently Null Textiles. Topically, we also addressed history of modernism in architecture and design with a monograph on Joseph Frank, a study of modernity in Sweden during the first six decades of the 20th century, and a landmark project that shifted thinking about the early work of Le Corbusier. In 2006, we marked a new beginning with Sheila Hicks weaving as metaphor, our first exhibition devoted to a living artist that evoked the materiality of textiles and the techniques of weaving in the actual construction texture and typography of a book that the designer Irma Boom has called her manifesto. 
Then our current project, the most ambitious research project to date, William Kent, Designing Georgian Britain, curated by Susan, that repositioned Kent in the 18th century British architectural studies, extending our connection with the V&A to a curatorial collaboration with Julius Bryant and transforming the conventional work plan of an exhibition publication. Ten, ten years in the making, it is our first project to be informed by discussion of a scientific committee, a word that Peter and I are going to enter into the language of the institution of British scholars. Now, with a long-term exhibition schedule soon to be in hand, established practices and experiments with new ones informed by a mode of thinking that never settles for the status quo, there is but one question to ask. What is our actual role? Or what is the actual role of a gallery in the changing academic life of this institution? We began investigating the potential connections between the gallery and the academic program in 1994 with Cross Currents of Modernism, a project that brought exhibition making to the classroom through a curriculum of that facilitated a student curated exhibition that brought works from the Virginia Museum of Art in Richmond to the BGC. These exceptional collection of modern design that students chose objects from, researched, and organized into an exhibition. Kratz Carnes was a singular attempt at this form of practice until 2004, when Tim Mulligan, our former director of external affairs, helped establish a collaboration with the Met, a model that coupled a Met curator with a BGC faculty member who worked as co-curators and jointly taught while nurturing student participation in exhibitions. An initiative that began with Vasmania, it's at the top, curated by Stephanie Walker and the late William Reeder. It led to a series of exhibitions with the Met, Aquamanilia, then English Embroidery in 2008, a collaboration between Melinda Watt from ESDA and Andrew Morrill, professor at the BGC, and this past summer, Salvaging the Past, George Henschel and French Decorative Arts from the Met, co-curated by Deborah Krohn, Ulrich Leben, and Daniela Kiesluck, Grosscheider. A most recent line of connectivity and collaboration between the two branches of the institution, what is now known as DPRI, Degree Programs and Research Institute, you'll hear about it later, and the gallery is the focus project, an initiative that thankfully brought Ivan Gaskell to the BGC in 2012. The brainchild of Peter Miller, who imagined a dedicated space in the gallery for faculty curated exhibitions and a practice that would establish showing or display as an intellectual project among our faculty who would serve as the professor curator, an identity that we are now deeply committed to embedding in the academic life of the institution. Begun in 2011 with this exhibition, Objects of Exchange, curated by our first fellow in anthropology, Aaron Glass, now a full-time professor of anthropology at the BGC, the exhibition further extended our institutional collaborations with the American Museum of Natural History. Since then, we have done a total of six focus gallery exhibitions. Arguably, until this celebration, the decorative arts, to some degree, have moved underground at the BGC, as other lines of inquiry associated with object studies have emerged. In this moment, when the very existence of the museum is debated and in question, the BGC, with its commitment to things, is positioned to make object studies the center of intellectual inquiry, discourse, and exchange with the connections between DPRI and the gallery we continue to build and to extend the connections across this campus on 86th Street. Thank you. So, now I can actually welcome you to the morning session. And I want to begin by thanking all the speakers this morning because they were immediately responsible, responsive 
to my request to participate. And I feel very strongly that each of them, in many ways, is a representative of this notion of beginnings. And that's what I think will be a kind of trajectory through this morning's talks. First, Taco Dibitz has been director of collections at the Rijksmuseum since his appointment in 2008. He trained as an art historian at Amsterdam Free <laughs> University and the University of Cambridge, and first came to the Rijksmuseum as curator of 17th century painting in 2002. Four years later, he was appointed head of the department that combined decorative arts. He has a lethal sense of humor. Taco helped to shape the revolutionary way the decorative arts are displayed in the now renovated Rijksmuseum building that opened last year. Moreover, his vision democratized the dissemination of the museum collection by creating one of the world's largest repositories of digitized museum images. This morning, he will share some of his thoughts on these remarkable contributions to one of the world's greatest historical museums. <laughs> 